Hello, everybody. My name is Amalia Scannell, and I'd like to welcome you to this second seminar in the current offering of UCD School Agriculture, Food Science and Research Seminar Series. This is the invaluable source of resource as it gives us an opportunity to hear about and discuss current themes of research across major research areas that underpin our School of Agriculture and Food Science. So this is the seventh year that UCD has hosted this event. So I'm delighted to be here today for virtually to chair the seminar and it's entitled Circular Economy in a Changing World. I'd like to thank Associate Professor Nigel Brunton for co-chairing the session with me. But before we start, I have been asked to bring a couple of things to your attention. So first of all, the session is being recorded. So you'll be available to view on the school YouTube channel afterwards. That's at UCD Ag Food. Today's session will take approximately 30 minutes and it'll be followed by 20 minutes of questions or thereabouts. So I invite you to submit your questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Now, just to be aware, the chat function is going to be disabled for the session. So you can only submit through that Q&A button. And you can do that at any point throughout the talk and we'll keep an eye on, on your submission. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. Antonis Zorpas. So Dr. Zorpas is a chemical engineer with a PhD in environmental management and engineering. He currently holds the position of assistant professor at the Open University of Cyprus in the Faculty of Pure and Applied Science. And he's the academic coordinator of the master's program of environmental conservation and management. His research background is in the strategic planning development in the framework of waste management, which covers a number of different areas, including life cycle analysis, waste minimization, environmental risk analysis, bioeconomy and the circular economy. So I'd like to welcome Antonis. It's a pleasure to have you here with us, even in a virtual sense. And I'm very much looking forward to learning more about the circular economy from you. So over to you, Antonis. Thank you very much, Amalia, for this uh, nice introduction. Um, honestly, it's an honor to be invited to once again from the University College of uh, Dublin and the School of Agriculture and Food Science. Uh, I'd like to thank personally you, uh, Edel, Nigel, and Valerie. And even though I didn't have the chance to visit Dublin these years, it's one of my favorite destinations because I had the chance in the past to cooperate with many other universities over there. I will try to, to provide you my knowledge and know-how in the area that we are going to discuss today. Thanks once again, and I hope you are audience to enjoy my, my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Uh, give me one moment just to see. Okay, here we go. Today I'm going to speak about circular economy in a changing world. And um, to be honest, there are many ways to go circular, uh, either to continue extract and either to use natural minerals, which some of them are in a very, very critical level, such as the rare earth elements, uh, which are in crucial actually for the economic development of, uh, of Europe, as those are being used to create smart equipment or, or other equipment that we are using. Just for the records, for those that are not familiar, critical minerals are the metals and non-metals that are considered vital for the economy well-being of the world's major and uh, emerging economies, uh, which their supply may be at risk due to geological scarcity or other geopolitical issues and trade policy or uh, other factors. And today, actually, I'm going to speak about truth. Uh, we're going to see five to six truths. First of all, we will never stop being consumers. What does that mean? We have to answer the main research question, why waste are being produced. There are many, many uh, reasons why waste are produced. Uh, unwanted material is a byproduct of uh, economic pressure and disposed of. Uh, limited life of products, large areas used to grow food that is never intended. Um, political maneuvers, uh, level and size of the market, the lack of motivation activities. And the most important one from my point of view is the advertising effect and the brainwash for unnecessary needs to buy product without needing them. And, uh, this is the effect that I'm talking about. Uh, 
about Black Friday and Cyber Monday, it's one advertising effect that uh, every year the WordPress feed us with a lot uh, of photos of crowds and busy electronic stores. Actually, for the history, uh, surprisingly, clothes and not electronics are number one, just to, to clarify this. Um, Black Friday and Cyber Monday, beside the other daily visit that we are doing in shop, has a direct effect on environment and on people. Sustainability, in general speaking, is not only about environment, but it's also an economic and um, a, social, uh, a social indicator. And it is these products which often contain or may consist if you want, or are packaged in a non-recycled plastic and could end up incinerated or in lead fields or in oceans, polluting our soils, our air, and sometimes our water. On the other hand, uh, we have some other advertising campaigns uh, providing to their clients the reasons not to buy their, their jacket or their products. For example, this advertising effect uh, indicated by Patagonia somewhere on 2000, 11 and after uh, many, many other enterprises follow this, this example, indicate to their clients the reasons not to buy their jacket if this jacket is not needed, because they will participate in the production of 36 uh, gallons of water, which is required to produce uh, the jacket, which actually it's enough for equivalent population of 45 people to feed them, uh, the 20 pounds of carbon dioxide emitted, or the amount of waste that is being produced, which is, is high. And this uh, actually leads us to the second truth. The second truth is still in that we will never stop produce waste. This is truth, uh, to be honest. And uh, from south to north, uh, from east to west, according to many, many reports released, uh, like World Bank or The Economist, we will continue to produce waste. And if we're going to see the forecast of those, uh, of those um, um, uh, data, we're going to find out that by 2050, more or less, we will produce in the European Union 2.1 kilos of waste per citizen. And uh, those waste has some direct effect on the environment. Uh, the direct effect is dealing actually with the um, uh, production of carbon dioxide emission. We cannot see carbon dioxide, but just to realize the volume of one ton of carbon dioxide, this is more or less equal with the third floor building. And beside uh, our daily activities uh, that produce uh, waste, uh, the second most important um, stakeholder that is producing huge amount of waste are enterprises. It is well known that enterprises are everywhere in Europe. Uh, we have more or less 23 million enterprises in the entire European country. Some of them have some unique characteristic. They have less than 10 employees, approximately 75% of those. And this is very, very important. Why? Those enterprises, micro enterprises, is the backbone of the local economy. This is true. On the other hand, they feel economy pressure. They sell to the local market. Uh, they are family oriented. Uh, they do not federate. Uh, they have limited access to new technology or other innovative innovations aspects. But the most important one, they produce huge amount of waste. And this gives us the third truth. The third truth is still in that our business, as most of them state, are small and they are not responsible for the pollution. This is wrong. This is myth because 60% of the existing uh, pollution that arises uh, uh, in, in Europe are, came from those enterprises. And just to make it clear, what uh, is the major impact of those enterprises uh, in the framework of carbon dioxide emission, let's see uh, a small video. Uh, that I took on in the National Museum of uh, of Austria indicate to us how the uh, the ice is metabolized in North Pole starting from 1994 on 1994. on 2004 and on 2011. This is the situation now uh, in the poll. And this actually leads us to the circular economy concept. It is well known that our economy, our planet cannot survive anymore if we continue with the linear model, which it's translated to take something, we make something, we use something, and then we dispose of something. 
The circular economy concept uh, seeks to rebuild our capital, whether this is financial, manufactured, uh, human, social, or natural. We have discussed a lot about this butterfly feature, which uh, is being released from Alec MacArthur. But if uh, circular economy is the story, I can tell you 100% that circular economy became a history and replaced from this new concept, the European Green Deal concept. However, both of them, they have a specific vision, actually the same vision. Circular economy aimed to increase prosperity while reducing dependency on primary materials and energy. On the other hand, European Green Deal vision has a clear target, how to achieve climate neutrality by 2050, implementing the 70 United Sustainable uh, Development Goals uh, before, 2000, uh, before 2030. Both circular economy and the European Green Deal some presented with some priorities that we're going to see in a while. Circular economy focus on, uh, on food waste and biomass and bio-based products, strategies about plastic and chemicals, about critical raw minerals, about, to, about construction demolition waste, about electronic materials, about packaging materials and services. On the other hand, European Green Deal has a clear target to reduce emissions. Reduce emissions up to 90% for transportation, to propose alternative fuels, to promote the biocircular economy concept. Actually, the biocircular economy concept incorporate the production of renewable biological and uh, resources and their conversion into food, feed, bio-based product and bioenergy through innovative and some efficient technologies. And also to develop a regulatory framework for biodegradable and bio-based uh, plastics. Both circular economy and European Green Deal has one real target, the pro to propose a strategy, actually to propose a common strategy, directly related with the value change in order to control our daily needs, requirements to minimize our footprint by controlling all our activities. And when we are talking about uh, footprint, uh, our footprint is dealing with some actual needs that we have. Those needs uh, include uh, the built-up land, the fishing ground, uh, the forest product, the grazing product, the crop land, the carbon, and so on. Just to realize uh, what is the need for each Cypriot, it's estimated according to the Libby Planet report uh, up to 4.9 hectares per person, while for each Irish it's approximately 5.2 hectares uh, per person to cover their needs in a yearly basis. So, among our needs, it's food, and we will never stop consuming food. This is true, and uh, we will continue to produce food waste. Food waste refers to the degrees, you know the definition, I'm sure about that, in the quality and the quantity of the food resulting from uh, decisions and actions by retailers, food services provider, and consumer. And food is wasted by many, many uh, ways. And I will give you the Apple experiment. The Apple experiment indeed is telling that in order to provide one kilo of apples to consume, we need 1.28 kilograms uh, to produce. Uh, we are losing in all the supply chain, uh, edible and inedible parts uh, of apple. However, the first key performance indicator on food waste go back uh, 2,000 years ago. Uh, if you are uh, make a huge research uh, uh, in the Gospels, according to Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and according to the well-known miracle for, Orth for Christian Orthodox uh, uh, and Catholics, uh, is the multi application of the five friends and the two fish in order to feed approximately 5,000 people. Uh, going through the Gospels, you, you will find a statement mentioned that, and they say, and they celebrate, and took up the rest of the fractions equal with 12 rich uh, baskets full. Meaning that, that the first key performing indicator of, on the production of uh, food waste was equal to 0 0.12 kilo per person 2,000 years ago. What's happened today? Today, the problem is, is significant, crucial. Uh, to manage the food waste, uh, actually, we are starting with understanding how much food is currently produced and what share of it can be prevented. This is true. 
uh, take into account that in the entire Europe, we have more or less uh, 90 megatons of food waste. Uh, the majority, more or less 55 to 57 percent, occurring during the food preparation and consumption at home. Based on that, we need to reduce each year to meet the United Nations Sustainable Goals, to meet the target set by the, uh, by the European Green Deal and circular economy, approximately 30 megatons of, uh, of food waste per year. And just to realize the main issues, according to the Agricultural Federal Organization, if food waste was a country, uh, it will be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter after USA and China. Okay, what's happened now in my country, uh, specifically, uh, according to many research that we have performed with my team, uh, we are producing approximately five to 600 uh, kilos uh, per year of waste, among them 180 to 420 kilos per year uh, from area to area are considered to be food waste. Um, or making a life cost analysis, we find out the, that those are equal with 600 to 700 euros per year or 13 to 70% of the total spent uh, in a yearly base for a four uh, person family. And to propose a management of food waste, we must start with the understanding, as I mentioned before, how much food waste is currently produced. And to find out, the food waste identity. This is a slightly uh, a research that we have done uh, in my area, in the area of, in the installation of Cyprus Protaras, so those who are familiar with the area, uh, indicate uh, the production of food waste, which was approximately 20% equal uh, edible and inedible food. Um, uh, and we have clarified uh, all the um, subcategories of uh, the food waste that have been produced in this area. And to convince that we must take action, uh, we translate this production of, uh, of those food waste into a real money. The total amount of food waste is approximately 3,500 tons, equal with 43,000 uh, euros approximately per year. This is how much the municipality is paying to manage those waste. However, the first applicable solution to reduce food waste is deal with prevention. This is true. The second one, uh, a solution is dealing with the uh, appropriate management, starting with the sorting at source, uh, in order to be in line with the concept of circular economy and European Green Deal, and to reduce uh, the carbon dioxide emission that has been released from those uh, amount of food waste. We can um, collect food from, uh, for example, from the hospitality industry separately or from the household, and to produce biogas and making a, a life cycle analysis just to realize uh, how a typical and applicable solution is dealing directly with those uh, strategy. Uh, in a yearly base, we produce 305,000 tons of waste, which means if we can treat them, we can save approximately 1,250 tons of carbon dioxide emissions per year, or approximately 400 of equivalent tons of oils. Or if, if this is not understandable, we can save in a yearly base approximately $45,000 in, in one area. Those, uh, the amount of those waste is equal uh, for the energy needs of approximately 200,000 uh, houses in, in, in a specific area. Now, with my team, uh, we have proposed another solution uh, related with two uh, agricultural product uh, with tomato waste and potato waste. We are producing biochars either to use it as a natural fertilizer or either to uh, design a filter for water purification. Uh, re regarding this research, we are now preparing uh, a technical book, uh, a technical book which will be released from Elsevier in 2021, dealing with the tomato processing byproducts and sustainable application of those uh, agricultural products. Packaging is likely to be one of the next development um, uh, phases regarding food waste. And uh, as it's a part of a food waste, we will never stop using plastic. This is truth and this is reality, to be honest. And uh, I don't know if you know Leo Hendricks Beigeland, it's, uh, it's considered to be the father of the plastic chemistry. And because of, of the discovering of the Beigeland, uh, now we are talking the entire European Union of how to develop a European uh, plastic st strategy to reduce or to uh, 
uh, let's say, uh, not, uh, not to use uh, any more um, single plastics, according to a specific directive. And to realize what uh, is the plastic pollution uh, nowadays is, the last, the last more or less 60 years we had produced uh, in, the, in the entire planet, more or less 8.3 billion metric tons of plastics. Uh, each European citizen, according to the statistics of 2015 from Eurostat, produce approximately 31 kilos per year uh, of plastics. So those are actual in the entire Europe with 20 million metro wagon on per year. Uh, the specific directive 2019, 904, if I'm correct, 2019, has a clear mission to avoid the single use uh, of plastics. Plastic are being used everywhere. Uh, we need plastic for packaging material, so we need plastics uh, for toys, for bottles, uh, for window frames, for anything. Anything you will see around you is considered to be a plastic. And uh, regarding 2018, the entire Europe demand was more or less 51 megatons uh, of plastics material. The other way on circularity to realize how can be uh, how can be saved uh, from the production of plastic and from food waste. Uh, as we'll never stop using plastic, then we must use plastic as a natural uh, resources to produce other products. And this is the mission of uh, of IKEA actually. The, uh, the Anna Grant, the, the product development manager of IKEA in Sweden, released the new mindset. A new mindset is dealing with the production of new materials, uh, of new items, like a kitchen from, uh, uh, from a recycled plastic bottles, or uh, to make good plastic composite chairs, for example, from uh, renewable sources, which they have more or less 55 to 60 percent uh, from a, a recycled plastic material or uh, to produce uh, building materials from GMO. It is well known that uh, <coughs> excuse me, we need lignin and cellulose as a building materials to produce bioplastic. Either those will be produced from genetically modified uh, food like sweet corn, for example, or uh, either will extract those uh, building materials from bioproducts and, and, and biomass. Now we are working with uh, a huge uh, horizon project uh, uh, on the extraction of uh, high added value products from uh, uh, solid olive uh, residue and the coffee spank brown like antioxidants uh, to be introduced in cosmetic industry, in pharmaceutical industry, or to produce uh, uh, other uh, detergents. However, the circular economy and European Green Deal has a huge history behind. It's, it's not, it, is not that they born uh, yesterday. Uh, those has a huge history starting from the 17th century. Actually, the von Karlovitz introduced the word sustainability, which means responsible man. But uh, we have started from the Treaty of Rome, starting well from the Treaty of Rome, which nothing was indicated, actually, to be honest, in the Treaty of Rome. And uh, there was only one statement, and if I'm, I remember correct, the Treaty of Rome emphasize on the harmonization of the environmental legislations uh, and uniformity in the fight against certain form of AIDS so that all the technical barriers to the free circularity of goods will not arise to the different national links. To the seven environmental action plans, which indicate where Europe wants to be on 2050, there are some key objectives that uh, were identified. First of all, to protect and enhance union natural capital. This is the first priority, which included in European Green Deal strategy and in the um, circular economy strategy. To, secondly, to turn union into a resource efficient green and competitive low carbon economy. And thirdly, to safeguard the union's uh, citizens from environmental related uh, pressure and the risk. So the main question remains, why circular economy? The answer is easy, to live within environmental limits. This is the target, either for circular economy, either for European Green Deal, and either for sustainable development goals. And living well means that our human development index, which is a very complex index, uh, and is calculated, taking into account, the, first of all, the life expectancy, uh, the level of education, and the, uh, the per capita income indicators uh, within uh, low ecological foundry, 
ecological footprint. This is the main reason actually uh, why circular economy. So coming to the end and uh, looking for some suggestions and uh, conclusions, I can say that uh, circular economy, European Green Deal and the Sustainable Development Co uh, Goals uh, offers one unique opportunity to our society to rediscover our economy, to make it more sustainable and mostly most, most uh, competitive. This uh, will bring uh, multiple benefits uh, to both to local communities and to business actually, but also to citizens who need to invest in order to change their behavior and their attitude um, and um, to convince them to, to take actions. And just to indicate to you how fast we must change, I'm going to show you a video not related with circular economy, but related with Formula N, with Formula One. Let's see 1950 and how Formula changed after 2013. So this is how the system works. Uh, world is changing very, very fast. Uh, and if we'd like to uh, comply with the target set by the European Green Deal and the circular economy and the United Nations Sustainable Goal, we must run fast. We don't have, uh, we don't have enough time. Those are some, uh, some of the last publication with my team uh, in the area of circular economy, uh, waste valorization, end of waste criteria, uh, sustainable development goals, you can find them and uh, I'm open for questions about those in case that you need some further information. So, coming to the end, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity and uh, to present uh, my views about the concept of circular economy and how fast we must run in order to uh, reach all those targets. And as one of my favorite philosophers said in George Bernard show, those who cannot change their mind, they cannot really change anything. Thank you very much for this uh, for this uh, presentation and for this lecture. Thank you very much, Antonis. Um, really, really excellent, comprehensive review of the area. There's so much detail on your slides. Um, I would just like to ask all of our participants if they have questions to pose to Antonis. Will you put them in the Q and A session? Um, I'm going to kick off if that's all right, Antonis. And I'm just going to ask. Do you think, in your opinion, a zero pollution Europe is actually attainable in practical terms by 2050? This is a very challenged question, Amalia. Thank you for asking. It's, it's extremely challenged. It's not dealing if I believe, if I don't believe. It's if I can do it. Um, targeting, for example, in, 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 in specific target groups or on enterprises maybe, or in, in small target group, or in, in, in some municipalities, just to indicate how a strategy will be developed, how to reduce waste, then uh, this can be happened. And I will give you an example about this. Uh, and, and it's in, on, on, the, on the social media, you can find it easy. 
in Cyprus, the Cyprus Telecommunication Authority, uh, it's been certified because it's almost zero polluted um, activity because they reduce their waste that they send to the landfill in less than 2.5% because they believe it. it, it to, to do a zero waste approach is dealing with people. If people believe of the suggestion that it's easy to do it, if not, then uh, we have issues. Okay, and just following on from that, we have a question from Nigel, and Nigel says he was surprised at the huge contribution of SMEs to food waste, and was asking if you were aware of any initiatives that specifically target SMEs to reduce food waste. So are there any initiatives specifically targeted? That kind of follows on nicely from that last answer. Uh, yeah, specific initiatives. Well, this is uh, depending, of, depending of the enterprises that are dealing with food waste, to be honest. If we are talking about hospitality industry, uh, most of the hospitality industry that are located in, uh, in islands like Cyprus, for example, are being controlled from uh, tour operators. This is quite difficult to reduce food waste because we have the concept of uh, all-inclusive uh, um, uh, tourists uh, that, are, are, that, that are visiting the hotel. So it's not easy to convince, for example, the, uh, the participants, the hoteliers to, uh, to produce um, less, uh, let's say, food from their clients. On the other hand, uh, if we are talking for um, in a household level, we have several, uh, several tools uh, for, to, to minimize uh, any kind of food waste. Uh, for example, we, have, we can develop um, a smart list from the supermarket to, to prepare less portion uh, of food and if we need it to prepare more and so on. Or we, we can use leftovers to uh, prepare other, for example, uh, part of food. On the other hand, uh, if food waste cannot be uh, avoided, we can valorize, we can we, we can collect food and valorize them to produce other building materials from other from other activities. Uh, that it's that is crucial. Okay, thanks for that. That's really really good. Um, I have a question here from Paul Murphy, and he's asking why is Cyprus's food waste per person so much higher than Greece's, for example? Uh, yes, this is also it's, it's a very challenging question, which I I use I usually receive. Where the permanent because we are, we don't include in 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 the statistics the uh, the tourist population. Uh, we we only use a permanent population, to be honest. And the permanent population is more or less, is more or less a million. But if we are entering into the formula, the equivalent population, which is more or less uh, three millions, as Cyprus uh, can guess approximately from three to five millions per year. So the index will be reduced. That's why it, it depends what kind of uh, <laughs> of number you are using. Thanks for the question, yes. <laughs> okay, another one from Hashim Rijal. Based on the facts that you've displayed in your presentation, how do you think we can strike a balance between the economic pillar of sustainability and other dimensions to achieve the 2030 targets? Well, this is so very, very- all the problems. <laughs> If you can see, solve this problem, please tell me also. I mean, it's uh, it's it's a very to to meet the target set on 2030 is dealing first of all with uh, uh, it's not dealing with a strategy. It's dealing with a, poli a, a, a political decision. To be honest, uh, it's a political decision to and to believe that uh, those targets must be must be reached. This is end of story. And then to, uh, to all of us to work together on one direction. If, for example, we believe on the reduction of carbon dioxide emissions uh, by reducing the volume of waste that we are producing, this we have a case. The reason that I indicate to you the, the small video of, uh, that um, present the variation of, uh, of the North Pole is that because lots of people don't believe on climate change. So, this indicates the real effect of, uh, of our waste uh, on, on the society because uh, food waste is not only uh, uh, an environmental uh, issue, it's dealing mostly with uh, a social issue. So affecting um, uh, the, uh, the North Pole and uh, diluting uh, 
uh, the eyes, it has significant issues to all of us. That's why. Okay, thank you. I've got another couple after coming in, so we're very active. Thank you very much to our participants. And um, yeah. Alex Evans is asking, is it necessary to eliminate anything from entering the circle? For example, carbon or fossil fuels or plastics? Or do we just keep raw materials in the circle and not let them go to waste? Oh, if it's challenged to to decrease the, the amount of a new materials entering this in a resource material, yes. Uh, actually, the, if I'm correct, the SDG 12 is dealing with this, how to reduce uh, natural resources, actually. Uh, we, to be honest, it's too difficult to, uh, to avoid uh, introduction to a cycle of, a, of, of a raw materials. This is uh, another truth. But we can minimize those and uh, we can replace them with other materials. Uh, for example, in case we would like to um, uh, produce uh, building materials for pharmaceuticals or from uh, cosmetics or from um, from others from or from other use, we used to need some. Uh, for example, we we need susonic acid. Susonic acid is is being produced. Uh, for example, from uh, petroleum, from petrochemical roots, or we can produce from a fermentation roots. So, depends uh, of what you would like to do. So, in that case, we can reduce the natural resources and we can keep into the cycle the, uh, the bioproduct. Okay. All right. So, it kind of depends on whether we need the raw material at the bottom line. Yes, to be honest. Okay, I've got a I've got a fairly specific question here, which might be nice because does not the holy grail requirement. So, how does how is food waste per capita calculated? And yeah. the, the Netherlands are mentioned as the biggest contributor. So, is that because they're one of the biggest food exporters? Well, the main question, to be honest, how a food waste um, is um, um, is calculated. Well, you will surprise um, because the European Union uh, on 2019 released, uh, I'm looking my, well, released two specific legislations, uh, so, sorry, two, two directives. The first one is the directive, uh, is the well-known Waste Framework Directive, which has been replaced from uh, the Directive 159, seven of 2019 and the other one uh, and it's exactly in the core of this question it's the directive uh, 2000 of 2019 which asked to lay down a, fo uh, a formal for reporting of data on, on food waste and for suspicion of the quality check reporting accordance with the waste from directive waste. What, what those directives want to do wants to clarify how to calculate food waste per sector. So this is a huge research opportunity, either for my university, either for you or for your students. And actually I announced a new PhD position about this, how to calculate food waste per sector, uh, household level, industrial level, uh, et cetera. We need a complete life cycle analysis. Uh, we need a specific flow chart. We need and data from the scratch, we need an in-depth analysis of the production of food waste, of, of food production. We need a lot of things. So it's not an easy to calculate uh, food waste, but in a household level, uh, you can do it, um, let's say easily, uh, if you can um, follow what the participants um, eat for one week to write down exactly the portion and so on, and what exactly they dispose of. So it's easy to, to have, let's say, an indicator. Okay. Okay, so I've got a few other questions that are kind of moving from consumers to industry. So maybe we'll go back to the consumer first because they, I think, drive industry a fair bit. So Irene Ward asks, what do you think consumers can do to encourage companies to change their packaging and their ways of operating? So is there an optimum strategy for consumers to take? Ah, this is a very marketing questions, actually. Um, consumers, um, yeah, of course, it's easy. I, I will not 
I'm not personally, I will I will share you my personal views on what I'm doing when I'm going, for example, in the supermarket. I avoid to buy uh, vegetables if it's packaged. I prefer to take one or two apples, to weigh them and then to put it in my bag. So if you avoid to buy something that is it, it's, it's packaged, then this is something that you ask pressure, uh, for example, to the um, uh, supermarkets, okay? On the other hand, we will not um, avoid using plastic packaging. This is this is true. Uh, maybe we can, um, maybe for example, we can ask uh, or push enterprises to find uh, and uh, introduce awareness, um, let's say activities of how to manage this plastic material, these new materials, to make it a bio material, to be more biodegradable and things like that. Yeah. Or, or to motivate enterprises to, to, to participate in that. I've noticed here in Ireland that some of our supermarkets are certainly doing that. They're changing their plastic to bioplastics. So that's good. That's, that's possible, that's good. yeah. So I, th I think voting with your feet is definitely the way to go on that one. Um, I have one here from Anastasia. What is your opinion on valorizing food waste that negatively affects um, using initiatives like food banks, food donations? Do you consider that to be a sustainable solution? Uh, we, are, we are touching now on a very sensitive ethical um, aspects, to be honest. On one hand, uh, if we can donate food, this is good. Okay, I mean, uh, if the food is safe and we can donate, this is this is magnificent. And uh, nowadays, I mean, we can we must go in that direction and to and to help people as much as we can. On the other hand, uh, to collect unknown food, I mean, from the perspective of quality and and and, and safety, and donate them, this is quite unethically. However. To valorize waste and to produce other um, uh, other materials, this is something. Uh, it's a huge. Uh, it's it's a huge research area. Actually, this is dealing with the Article Six of Waste Framework Directive, which indicate when a waste case to be a waste and 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 and, and to to use it as as a product. Uh, Article Six has a specific criteria: how to disclassify the waste. So if we would like to valorize the food waste uh, to produce, for example, as I mentioned before, susunic acid, for example, uh, that means we must declassify it. We must provide uh, um, specific criteria, specific protocol. We must find out their impact to the environment. If, for example, the product that is going to be uh, replaced uh, is, more is more environmental friendly and so on. So. Uh, to declassify waste and to, and to use food waste for other purposes, to, pro to produce uh, animal feed uh, and using specific protocols, yes, I'm open with that uh, by providing specific criteria uh, for a specific purpose. Okay, very good. Um, I've got an interesting one here that um, is piquing my interest, certainly from Agonez Belenzi. Um, she thanks you very much for your interesting presentation. And she wants to know, do you think the true cost accounting would have a positive effect on reducing food waste? The, the true, the true? True cost accounting. Would that yes. have a positive effect? I imagine, I'm imagining that's got something to do with um, what you were saying about following people through managing what they have in their house, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I understood well the question. Actually, do you want to maybe clarify the question for us? Yes, a little bit? yes, please. Can you maybe give us a quick clarification on that. And um, I kind of have a, another question that I would mind asking about. If you were to pick one waste stream as the most dangerous to our planet and to our environment, what would it be? Oh, <laughs> well, uh, the most dangerous for our planet. Hmm. Those uh, these are dealing with many criteria to find the most dangerous waste. Um, for example, uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, we used olive oil. Olive oil is very healthy product. 
On the other hand, uh, olive oil solid residue and uh, olive miles waste are extremely toxic. Uh, you cannot uh, use them easily. Then we have the typical food waste. Food waste is participate more or less in 20% of the carbon dioxide emission that is being produced in the entire planet. Uh, so uh, then we have uh, toxic elements. Um, uh, this is a very, very difficult question to be answered and it's dealing with the, uh, the criteria that <laughs> you must put behind the formula to be answered. However, I'd like to emphasize on hazardous waste. Uh, from my point of view, due, due to toxicity level, um, which um, uh, lead us to extremely, uh, let's say, dangerous conditions. Okay. And I have another question that um, has been on my mind for some time. As you know, all over the world, there's vegans and vegetarians that are constantly telling us that killing animals is killing our planet. And one of the questions that I would have, because I'm a food scientist, I'm not really um, an animal scientist, and I'm sure Alex could probably also feed into the discussion on this. Is it more sustainable to not farm animals and import protein from foreign countries, or is it better and more sustainable to grow and feed locally? What do you think is the better solution? What is the better solution? Yeah, in terms of <laughs> carbon footprint, in terms of waste produced. Uh, um, this is also a very nice uh, question, Amalia. Thank you for that, actually. And this is a huge uh, research um, field, to be honest. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm looking some of my uh, uh, comments that I, I found something related with food waste on, uh, and I didn't present it today. Well, I don't know if you know the footprint, uh, for example, of meat lovers of uh, the vegans. The footprint is exactly, is not the same. Vegans, for example, has 1.5 tons of carbon dioxide emission per person, why meat lovers has more or less 3.3 tons of carbon dioxide emission per person. Well, the cultivations, uh, for example, of, uh, of, a, of things to produce animal feed uh, has also uh, a huge impact to the environment. Uh, going uh, years ago, one, uh, if I remember correct, Philip Edward Anton von Lennart, it was a Nobel Prize somewhere in the beginning of uh, ninth, of the beginning of the next, of the previous century, indicate that, uh, if I remember that, the European land is losing uh, white yield due to soil erosion. Meaning that we must find the way to cultivate um, through, I don't know, through chemical fertilizers or other fertilizers, the land. So uh, the, car the ecological footprint between the one and the other, it's very, 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 in a sense, it lines. So uh, I prefer to leave it to the audience to, uh, to find the way what they prefer. But to be honest, even though somebody is a vegan or vegetarian, is also pollute as the uh, meat lover or, or the non-beef, for example, lovers or the no chicken lover or the, let's say, the average uh, people that they eat approximately 2,000 calories per day. Okay. I've got actually a clarification for yes, on that question on cost accounting. So what you wanted to know was, could increasing the cost of food products to increase production sustainability? Uh, no, this is some, yeah, 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 they, yeah. I was afraid that actually, if this was the, the meaning of the question, uh, to increase the cost of food, I'm, I'm not sure about this. I mean, uh, taking into account the poverty and one of the main uh, SDG that aiming to zero poverty, uh, this is, uh, from my point of view, is not the solution. But to find a way for the sustainable management of food production, 
uh, and to produce the food that, that uh, the population need, the actual need, and not a uh, huge amount of food. This is uh, it's quite it's more attractive to be honest. Okay, um, I think it's kind of time to draw the session to an end at the minute now. So can I just take this opportunity to thank you, Antonis, for taking part on behalf of myself, the committee, and all of the participants. It's been an extremely interesting discussion and a very, very, very interesting and fact-filled talk. So I'm looking forward to delving into those slides a little bit more afterwards. Um, I'd also like to thank Nigel, the co-chair, for working behind the scenes and relaying all the questions to me. And lastly, guys, can I just remind all the attendees that the next seminar is on the 24th of October and the details will be put up on the screen at the end. So thanks I'd again. Like, I'd like to thank once again uh, all of you, Amalia, Nigel, Little, uh, Valerie, the University College of, of Dublin. Um, honestly, it, it, it's, it, I enjoyed it, even though I, I'm, I'm not there. Uh, to drive your famous Guinness beer, uh, I promise you to do it maybe next time if you will invite me. Thanks, thank you very much. And um, I'm open with further collaboration with uh, your um, uh, audience. If somebody is coming from industrial sector and is looking, uh, somebody from Cyprus, my team is open for collaboration, even though on valorization of waste or on demonstration plants or in life cycle analysis, or even to calculate the real amount of the food that's been produced in any activities, we are open. Thank you very much, and I hope that I help on this seminar cycle. Thank you.